so hello everyone uh we are on episode number 4 of clinical research talk series and the topic of uh, today's episode is clinical trial design and phase analysis so in this particular session we are going to talk about different clinical trial design right from phase 0 to phase 4 and also what are the statistical analysis methods used from one phase to another because you have to understand that when we get approval for phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 so there are changes in statistical analysis and this particular analysis is what leads to approval of the medication so without further ado let's start this video so i would like to inform that uh, this uh, particular series is in collaboration uh, with aditi so who runs the alpha 2 uh, omega channel and also uh, clinical aim research and clinical research x360 these are youtube channel we are also on spotify as you can see uh, your clinical research talk series and you can even listen to our uh, sessions in terms of and save some time so let's start so let's understand uh, the different phases of clinical trial so clinical trial are in generally considered to be uh, conducted in three phases from phase 1 to phase 2 to phase 3 and then the approval so before submission of phase 1 uh, to test in humans there are pre clinical studies which are done in animals okay so that phase is called as pre clinical phase after that it moves to phase 1 where the number of participant change from 20 and also the number of indication or focus area changes so in phase 1 we look at safety where phase 2 we look at safety and efficacy and so on and so forth until we have the fda approval and that particular medication then can be given to the masses so this is in general about various clinical trial phases so let's look at each phase in detail and also get to know about the statistical analysis of each phase so let's start from phase so phase 0 uh, is the phase called as first in man study because here before this phase you have done pre clinical trial which was done on animals but in this particular phase you are introducing the drug for the first time in human beings and although the genome of some animals and humans can be 99% similar but there can be some dissimilarities which could lead to adverse effects so that is why phase 0 is critical here the number of participant is only 20 to 30 healthy participant because here we are not focusing on the effectiveness or efficacy of the drug but here we are giving a very low drug less than 1% just to check the clinical effect of it and if there are any adverse effect that is the focus and the aim of this particular phase is to test between chemical analogs and to see if there are any intended clinical effects so that is phase 0 for you now let us understand the statistical analysis of this phase uh yes so so as mentioned uh, in phase 0 we are not necessarily testing any sort of uh, clinical effect although we may uh, it depends from trial to trial uh, but we are testing we want to see uh, how the trial is in uh, how the medication affects humans uh, so what we observe is uh, adverse effects and also in inferiority or superiority or non inferiority between chemical analogs if applicable so here what we do is that we are getting the summary of approximately 20 patients in uh, different kind of cohorts and assuming that we have say a couple of cohorts between chemical analogs uh, we do the statistical summary of each uh, of the patient and it's very important to consider the statistical summary of an individual uh, cohort separately because that's what we want to know at this point of time or at this early phase and then uh, here uh, we choose the statistical analysis method according to the end point so la in the last series in the last episode i had mentioned uh, about end points and how uh, end points are different kind of end points can determine the statistical method so for example if we have a, a continuous end point or continuous data then we would go for a different kind of end point we would go for a different kind of statistical uh, uh, significance maybe 
uh, we will uh, try a, a null or alternative hy hypothesis endpoint. Whereas if we have continuous data, we might go for t-tests or other sort of uh, statistical test, which is according to the endpoint that we want. And here we do compartmental analysis to understand the pharmacokinetic parameters. So this will be uh, well in a, a very generalized pharmacokinetic parameter since it's not done in patients because here we choose healthy subjects. So here we will understand the pharmacokinetic parameters in healthy human subjects uh, and understand how the drug pharmacokinetic is. And we could also do covariate or multivariate analysis to understand the effect of covariates on the uh, dose, given dose or the drug. Now, what is covariate or multivariate analysis? So uh, our covariates can be considered as uh, input variables or values that do not have direct effect on the do on the drug or the effect. For example, uh, weight or height or sex or you know renal efficacy, this could be considered as a covariate because though it is not the input value because uh, for example, something that would be directly affecting the performance of the drug could be the dose or could be the chemical composition of the drug. But this, this is not the direct input value, but more like an indirect input value, which could affect uh, the drug performance. Uh, so these are what we call covariates. And there could be multiple covariates. Uh, so hence, we need to do multivariate analysis to come to a conclusion uh, and uh, understand the effect of covariates. So maybe we could do individual covariate analysis, such as understanding the weight separately or understanding the effect of the height separately, or it could be combined. So here we also, as, as discussed previously, we can build a basic pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic model, which can be later escalated in specific patients. But here we do a very generalized pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic model to understand the dose and covariate effect. So, uh, I mean, we heard we can build a basic structural pharmacokinetic model, which is whether to understand whether it's a one compartmental, two compartmental or multi compartmental, uh, multi compartmental drug. Uh, and uh, I mean, if the pharmacokinetics are like that and also understand how different kind of covariates un uh, uh, can uh, can uh, affect the pharmacokinetics and based on this finalized pharmacokinetic uh, uh, pharmacokinetic model which will be which will be further validated we can build a pharmacodynamic model to understand the pharmacodynamics like whether it's a direct pharmacokinetic model or an indirect pharmacokinetic model or uh, you know is it a delayed pharmacodynamic model and here we kind of establish a very basic pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic model in healthy patients and also we can plot outcomes against other one another or do a regression based analysis. Now, uh, what kind of uh, outcomes can we plot against each other? So maybe we can, a very basic outcome to plot against each other would be the dose and time effect, or maybe we can even uh, plot, say the weight against the dose effect or other things that we think are important to see and the the reason that we plot the outcomes against each other is that we understand what kind of a relationship they have like maybe they have like a linear relationship whereas you know a simple linear re relationship could be that uh, in in a, in a, in patients with higher weight maybe the con the concentration would be higher due to various reasons or a, a patient with lower weight could have uh, like uh, other uh, other kind of relationships. Um, uh, yeah, so so you could have a direct and indirect effect 
with plotting outcomes with, within each other and understand whether they have a real linear relationship or not. And here at this point, you could also do if, if applicable uh, regression analysis uh, um, to predict different kind of outcomes. Though many a times you don't do uh, regression analysis at this phase because you don't have enough of um, uh, enough of data. Now, what is regression analysis? So, regression analysis is basically uh, to understand uh, when you plot uh, against an x y value to understand uh, the different kind of to understand the mean and understand the outliers of that of that uh, value, but uh, as mentioned before, many a times you don't do regression analysis at this phase because it doesn't have enough of data and conclusion. Yeah. So now let us move on to phase one design. So we have uh, talked about phase zero. In phase one, what happens is we are evaluating three uh, typical uh, items here. First is the safety uh, part of uh, view. Second is the efficacy. And third are the common uh, side effects with dose range. The thing is in phase one, we focus on a limited number of participants, again, 10 to 15. But here, what we are focusing on, we are focusing on, on a single dose. We are also testing the dose range, what we are planning to give in this particular clinical trial. We are deciding whether the range should be X or Y. And we test this range in, uh, in kind of ascending model, where we go from lower to higher just to avoid the adverse event and also give us an idea that what are the immunological effects shown by the subject at a particular dose. So that is the uh, focus of it. And the uh, main aim of it is obviously the dose selection and what is the maximum tolerated dose, which that means the dose at which we see the maximum uh, immunological uh, reaction or maximum adverse event. So here in phase one, the focus is to selection of the dose to see the adverse event and what are the final uh, dose concentrations of it. So now let us see what is the statistical analysis uh, part of phase one study. Yeah. So as mentioned before, here we want to find out like, um, you know, a different kind. We want to explore. We are still at the exploratory phase. So we want to uh, look at different outcomes, different patients, uh, and also different outcomes in the single ascending dose study as well as multiple ascending dose study. And in usual, uh, single uh, first we have single dose ascending study, and on based on the statistics of that, we go to a multiple dose ascending study. Or although there are times that they happen at simultaneously in different cohorts. Therefore, it's very important to have, again, we have statistical summary of different kind of patients and, and their outcomes, because we need to see what kind of outcomes they have, like depending on what kind of drug we're selecting. And we need to have a statistical summary of that. And at all points, statistical summaries are really important. And we need to look at whether there's a difference between the statistical summary at the first at phase zero and phase one and now we look at visual representation of individual variable of input variables versus outcomes where we see if different input variables are, uh, have uh, an effect on the outcomes whatever they could be and also here we understand the absorption phase and elimination phase of the pharmacokinetics. Like at what phase do, does, at what uh, time and at what concentration does the drug absorb? And also at what time and concentration does it eliminate? And these, these kind of, uh, this information also kind of helps us in the calculation of individual pharmacokinetic parameters such as Cmax, Tmax, bioavailability, elimination constant, half-life, etc. Now here, since we have an idea of the pharmacokinetic parameters in a group, we also can calculate a pharmaco individual pharmacokinetic parameters and we statistically summarize them to understand more. And uh, now per dose, because since we have single ascending dose studies as well as multiple ascending dose studies, we will 
also take the pharmacokinetic parameters and calculate them. And then we will take a statistical summary of those per dose. Because through that, we can actually um, understand more about the dose, more, understand more about the clinically significant dose and also the dose that we do not want because in case they're ca causing adverse effects. So he, this also kind of gives you, gives us final statistical analysis uh, outcomes per dose. Uh, so that can, helps us in our dose selection. But, uh, and uh, hence we are exploring different outcomes in different doses. And as mentioned in the previous uh, phase, we also do covariate analysis here because since we're doing a single ascending dose study and a multiple ascending dose study, we need to uh, understand uh, different variables uh, that can influence the dose. And pharmacodynamic effect is analyzed finally. And we develop the pharm pharmacodynamic model and see if there are different changes between the previous pharmacodynamic model or do we follow the same pharmacodynamic model? Yeah. So now uh, we move on from phase one to phase two. So in phase two, it is also called a therapeutic exploratory phase where the efficacy uh, is focused on while maintaining uh, while maintaining the efficacy at uh, in different number of subjects, here the number of uh, volunteers uh, or even the volunteers in some uh, medical condition go from 100 to 300. And these uh, volunteers in case of vaccine can be healthy or in case of uh, other clinical trial, for example, diabetic clinical trial, they can be diabetic subjects. Here a particular medic uh, medical condition is targeted and your uh, multiple doses are tested against the placebo. So why do we uh, include placebo in clinical trial? It is because to understand whether the given medication is having its effect or efficacy based on its chemical formulation or is any other factor such as the mindset of the subject or uh, the belief that a particular uh, medication shall cure a particular disease. Is that affecting uh, the effectiveness of medication? That is why a placebo is given. So a placebo against the actual uh, drug is tested and aim of this particular uh, phase is to explore the clinical effects against the targeted disease. So how is this particular medication uh, reducing the adverse event or uh, reducing the progression of that particular disease and also understand what are the adverse effects because you could be curing one thing and another thing could uh, show you in terms of adverse event. So that is also a main focus area of phase two design. Now let's see what are the statistical analysis of phase two study. Yes, so now we've now our data is expected to change completely because we have patients in this cohort. We have patients of that particular disease and also understand it that if a patient has one disease, uh, they could have other compromised uh, factors. For example, maybe they could be cancer patients, but they have compromised renal function and other problems. So we here we expect that our data will be nothing like the data of healthy subjects. So we have to repeat the statistical summary of different parameters. Uh, we have to uh, do the uh, statistical summary of uh, the different kind of parameters with respect to the dose as also re with respect to their own covariates. Uh, so covariates such as uh, the weight, height and other, uh, other, uh, other variables of patients, which will be very different from healthy subjects as mentioned. So we do the pharmacokinetic analysis again. And uh, we, here we will focus on the parameters that define like uh, uh, the pharmacokinetics like absorption, metabolism, excretion, and distribution. And this will be here we will understand the pharmacokinetic parameters in patients. And here the pharmaco, we define the pharmacodynamic effect. We put a lot of focus on the pharmacodynamic effect. So either we will focus on certain biomarkers or we will focus on concrete endpoints. So we assume, we assume that uh, the pharmacodynamic model is uh, made at this point. We understand the model. 
And here we will focus more on the biomarkers and complete endpoint. And the statistical analysis of this phase is very important because here we want to, to select a final dose for the phase three study. And we want to uh, finalize clinical endpoint. And this will lead to dose selection in patients. Now, the statistical dose selection is important because we need to make sure that it's analyzed in a way that they have uh, they have minimum side effects, but also the uh, the final PD uh, pharmacodynamic effect should be uh, at a clinical level that you know they, that they don't it, that they should have more than a minimum effect. So this is this these are very important in terms of the statistical phase two analysis. So here you could also look at different kind of aspects like. Uh, maybe you could look at a T test or a Z test or even uh, uh, determine the statistical significance at this point. And uh, this would vary according to what kind of data you have particularly. And uh, this is one of the most statistically important phases because we are determining this for patients. And we, from the next phase onwards, we are going to go to a more heterogeneous group of patients and this will this statistical the final statistical outcome will end the exploratory phase and this will be the confirmation like uh, the, the statistical confirmation of what we already know from the previous trials yeah so now coming to uh, phase three design now we have uh, as we have seen in phase two our dose is decided now now, what we are focusing on, we are focusing on the uh, exploratory effects of the uh, effectiveness of this particular drug. So what we want to do here is now we have a fixed dose and we want to test that particular fixed dose in uh, a larger uh, population. This larger population, as Aditi correctly said, it is going to be heterogeneous uh, population, not only selected to one particular area or limited number of uh, patients. So number of patients increased tremendously from 1000 to 3000. And these, this is just a standardized number, 1,000 to 3,000. It is more than 3,000. Okay, it can be 10,000, 15,000 also. And uh, these particular volunteers are targeted for a very specific uh, medical condition for which this particular medication or the molecule is being uh, marketed. Here also, you can test multiple ascending dose, but uh, mostly the dose is fixed in phase two. And we uh, focus on the adverse effects and the efficacy part of it. So aim of this particular phase three would be the confirmation of clinical effects, okay, against the targeted disease, and also understand that how this drug performs in terms of efficacy in larger target populations. Because this is the last uh, opportunity for the uh, study trial investigators and the sponsor to test their medication, because after phase three, we are going to submit uh, all the clinical data to the regulatory authority and post uh, which they will analyze the data and provide marketing approval. So this is one of the biggest phases of clinical trial. Now let us see what are the statistical consideration of phase three. Okay, so at this point, we have a very heterogeneous uh, group of patients and we also have will have a lot of heterogeneous data because uh, here we also prefer like uh, 1,000 to 3,000 patients, which is a lot of data, as well as it could be a multi-centric trial in different countries. So we could get different results from different, uh, say, different races or different kind of patient groups that we're looking at. So again, here we can use, we can do a statistical summary of patient demographics. Uh, we can, uh, which is, uh, which we have to look uh, at the dose that we are doing it. We have to do it in the particular cohort. We have to be very particular about that. And adverse effects uh, have to be taken individually and together. Now, the importance of taking every, uh, of statistically summarizing everything individually is that we understand the effect of the dose in that particular group. And that could be very important from a, from a local regulatory perspective. And also we understand if there are certain kind of varieties of adverse effects in the particular group. 
also in uh, it is important to take the statistical summary together so i mean in two different data uh, data sets uh, so together can give uh, a more global perspective of the drug so yeah we do the statistical summary together and individually and also here we can have an application of machine learning which could uh, identify different kind of outcomes as well as it could predict different kind of outcomes because we have enough of data here and we have enough of heterogeneous data here in the previous phase we had smaller data sets and maybe not so heterogeneous data sets so machine learning was not preferable at that phase at this phase we can use machine learning for a number of things as mentioned before in our previous episode uh, here also we do pkpd models because this is important at each phase it's important to do it uh, because here we are getting a heterogeneous population and we need to understand their particular covariates and uh, we need to understand whether we make decisions based on those covariates and we hope that at this level uh, the pkpd model is is standard that we don't have to make a pkpd model but more like we follow a pkpd model and through that we can understand their own how their individual covariates affect the pkpd model and this can give us a lot of information such as uh the final dose and the final outcomes and uh, a lot more information because pk kpkpd model can vary from very simple to very complex so that can give you a lot of information at each each point and we do statistical tests separately uh, when we uh, like t test anova hypothesis testing and again as mentioned before this depends on the end point so this usually gives us the final statistical decisions whether there is an inferiority on an or a non inferiority and the final statistical analysis and these are the statistical endpoints that we will submit to the regulatory authority in order to get approval for marketing yeah yeah so once you get the approval for marketing clinical trial does not stop there there is a phase 4 which is called as post marketing surveillance so now till this point of time till phase 3 study we were go, uh, giving a particular medication for certain uh, medical condition for example we developed a drug for diabetes but when that drug is prescribed to uh, a patient in the open market and when it is used by uh, everyone in the world you cannot restrict um, medical conditions because now here there will be a subject who has diabetes along with uh, anemia or who has other uh, kind of comorbidities so here the number of drug drug interaction the number of uh, interaction with other kind of medical comorbidities increases as well as the number of subjects now in phase 3 study there were 3000 subject but when the drugs get marketed and when you can use it freely or when the doctors can prescribe that particular drug then the number of subjects increases and it is uh, and it creates a lot of data so after marketing of the drug so uh, for 20 years post marketing surveillance is done which is uh, generally required phase 4 study here the number of participant is not limited it can be uh, it can be all the subjects who are using this particular medication and when it comes to dose here there is a variation because in phase 3 during uh, regulatory approval we recommended that this particular medication is showing efficacy at this particular dose but based on the comorbidities health condition gender uh, what kind of uh, effects that uh, the particular medication has the dose is variable in from one subject to another therefore dose can also uh, create uh, various uh, effects on the subjects and why we do this phase 4 trial is to understand that what are the drug drug interaction or what are the adverse event that uh, the manufacturer or clinical trial investigator missed during the control tra- uh, clinical trial in phase 3 so to understand the effect of the drug to understand the adverse event that are being caused after marketing so that is where phase 4 comes in and please remember that phase 4 uh, 
is not only in terms of surveillance but it is also advised uh, by the governments all over the country because it is not just approval is not just granted uh, for the entire lifetime approval is granted based on that that it does not create any negative adverse event if there are cases reported of negative adverse event then that uh, particular drug can be banned or stopped and again the clinical trial uh, can be recommended so the sponsor is also very active the pharmaceutical company in phase 4 design and they focus on the clinical effects after the approval and what are the side effects and they constantly monitor during phase 4 so uh, the number of data generated during phase 4 is tremendous and now let's see what happens in phase 4 data analysis yeah so phase 4 analysis is when we get into like a phase called pharmacovigilance analytics so this is basically very complex and also a, lo- a much larger data and here one has one uses advanced analytical techniques with the purpose of uh, you know examining a lot of data as well as a variety of data sets and you it contains safety information and you can also use machine learning to uncover hidden patterns unknown correlations test trend and patient preferences and several other useful information that can help say organizations like pharmaceutical companies or health economic companies or contract research organization or regulatory organization to make more informed decisions so what what is unique here is that we have big and heterogeneous data analysis so here one can actually use this a uh, standardized statistical analysis i think uh, and one can also be using uh, machine learning so what kind of machine learning can uh, be used here or would be very effective so here um, unsupervised machine learning would be really effective uh, as mentioned in the previous video and so supervised machine learning is when data is not labeled in any way so you're not getting a data set with the, this this thing that you have to predict you're using a lot of heterogeneous data around the world with the marketing drug and the outcomes uh, so here the most common use of unsupervised machine learning is to do clustering analysis so in the sense that um if if there is a side effect that is reported then uh, it it is clustered together it is sorted together with uh, with the likelihood or uh, and there there this sort of clustering is done and then from there the clustering could be analyzed to understand whether i mean there there the clusters can be statistically analyzed to understand whether uh, there are more uh, more side effects occurring in a certain population or other kind of trends that uh, that can be statistically analyzed and also to give uh, clustering can also unsupervised machine learning can also help understand different kind of uh, relationships between data and this this is done by reducing the dimensions of data to a smaller dimension to understand if there are certain kind of relationships between data but it is not uncommon to also use supervised learning here uh, because supervised learning is uh, is can be gathered from a labeled data set so this can be done when there is a particular data set or particular amount of uh, structured data about certain kind of side effects or other effects that have occurred from here one can predict if there is uh, a certain kind of trend so here supervised learning can be uh, can be used and one other very important use uh, of unsupervised learning is if uh, if a drug has a certain effect of, and if that needs to be or can be repurposed because unsupervised learning or deep learning it is capable of understanding a uh, certain unlabeled data and understanding if there is something other than the intended effect and whether that drug can be used for another purpose so this is a lot of useful data that is coming out and that can be structured 
Now, uh, here one can also do outcomes to adverse event ratio analysis. So this is the same as uh, understanding that why a certain adverse effect has occurred, where has it occurred, what are the outcomes, and what is the ratio in a certain population. And uh, that can be taken as individually, uh, as individuals uh, data as well. Now trend analysis, as I mentioned, that uh, maybe there was a certain adverse effect that was observed in certain populations. So this can be done through trend analysis uh, and uh, and yeah, so it can also, trend analysis can also help uh, make uh, local regulatory decisions or local decisions regarding the drug and as well as can be helped in repurposing the drug. Uh, so now, uh, as I've already talked about clustering and machine learning based analytics and, there are, and its wide applications, I would also like to talk about signal detection. So signal detection is basically when certain adverse effects are, are reported and the agencies that are responsible for uh, for drug safety detect these. So this can either be done manually, either they can be picked out and uh, they can be uh, they can be in in a different data set which will be further analyzed uh, in the future, or it can be done automated. Uh, so how is automated uh, signal detection done? Well, it is done. This is also done in an unsupervised way because uh the common side effects can be labeled and uh, they can match against the data database of known side effects or there are other ways of also labeling the side effects or the signals now uh, there are other ways like natural language processing or uh, text automation or text mining that can also automate these processes. So there are a variety of ways of automating signal detection. However, uh, a combination of automated and manual sig uh, signal detection is very important because oftentimes uh, automated signal detection can fail. For example, if we have a certain uh, side effect and it's labeled in a certain, certain way, uh, the i mean understand that the the whole world does not speak english the whole world does not have the same proficiency that is there that would be there in a labeled data so maybe they could make a typo or they could make uh, they could not report it in that way or they could report it in their own language so that would not match to the database that or the labeled data that we want so hence we would get a lot of confused data so hence, it is very important for the drug safety to have manual uh, manual detection and in the future to improve signal detection, to understand that and include, uh, like say, other language in signal in automated signal detection or uh, make a software uh, sophisticated enough to understand that there could be certain common typos. So yes, so this is the how in uh, an overview of how the post marketing data is analyzed yeah, yeah. and also i would like to add that uh, who uh, i mean there are agency who look uh, and focus typically on pharmacovigilance uh, data and signal detection so uh, globally uh, it is the uh, who uh, uppsala monitoring center who takes care of the global uh, pharmacovigilance signal detection also, this particular agency lays down global guidelines for pharmacovigilance uh, programs and how uh, analysis uh, should be used. So, the so this is the premier agency for pharmacovigilance, and also it when it comes to uh, country, they have their own individual pharmacovigilance program. Such as India has the uh, pharmacovigilance program of uh, India. Okay. So PVPI uh, PI also uh, clearly explain what are the pharmacovigilance uh, guidelines that a particular regulator must, uh, that a particular sponsor must follow and how uh, we must monitor the signal detection when it comes to post-marketing uh, data analysis. So this is about uh, phase four uh, post-marketing uh, data analysis. Now let's talk about what are the next things we are going to see in this particular series. So uh, when it comes to uh, 
the future we are all excited and we want to know that what are the upcoming exciting aspects of uh, clinical research so in future series we are going to talk about the decentralized clinical trial because as we know uh, that clinical trial uh, are conducted uh, globally and multi centered but this is a new concept called as decentralized clinical trial so so we are going to see what are the aspects of it and how this can shape the future of clinical trial also uh, the now since the advent of ai and machine learning we have seen the in silico clinical trial so how machine learning or how uh, ai can assist in in silico uh, trials so how uh, these can compute a large number of data and how that can reduce the cost of medication directly so that could be uh, another exciting option for the future and we are also going to uh, shed light on the risk based monitoring so rbm uh, is a very hot topic currently so we are going to also uh, look at uh, rbm and its uh, aspect so what do you think aditi about it yeah i'm i'm really excited for this uh, because the world is changing clinical trials are changing uh, finally the recognition of them is um, it has come to light and i'm really as usual you, you know in quite excited to talk about the in silico aspect uh, because i've dealt with some of these softwares myself and uh, to talk about risk based monitoring and other aspects so i'm really excited and we're going to talk about different kind of trials we're going to talk about uh, trials that have been done so we have something really exciting we have something that we are really going to learn a lot while making these videos because it's not just that we put information out there we also learn while making these videos so yeah and this is the bibliography and the references without which we would not have been able to put information out there and i i mean as usual that uh, we're very thankful that people put information out there and we hope to contribute to the community of information so thank you for tuning in and we are really looking forward to our next video on the future of clinical trials next week so stay tuned and thank you all of you